So today we are going to discuss directly about the actual procedures of Panchakarma, the three main procedures, which are four main procedures, in fact, which are actually emesis, purgation, and uh, enema, which is two types of enema. The decoction enema and oil enema. So this is what we will discuss today. One of the procedures we already, uh, you know, discussed in the previous lecture, that was the nasal purge. So the remaining four procedures we will discuss today. So we start. So there are five methods of cleansing. So I want to clarify some misconceptions that there's a difference between five methods of and panchakarma as such. So if you look at five methods of this is Vamana, it is called in Ayurveda, in Viraja nation, Vasti, which is medicated enema, Purge, which is Dasya, and then Rekta Moksha, which is bloodletting. So these are five methods of action of the body. However, this is not Panchakar. I don't know if you know what are panchakarmas. So these five are actually not panchakarmas. I think that these are the panchakarma. So I wanted to clarify that first of all. Uh, shodhanas, or which means these are five methods in the body. Now, is this clear? Okay. Right. So now, the five procedures or panchakarmas are actually, you know, they're very similar. There's only a slight difference. It's really very important. These are vamana or emesis or purgation, nasya or nasal purge. Vasti is of two groups. That is niruha vasti, which is decoction enema, and anuvasana vasti, which is oil enema. Between five five cleansing procedures and panchakarma is with bloodletting Bloodletting in Chakarma. So instead of bloodletting, we have oil enema. And this importance is significant. Five methods of purification. means that you have 
have five ways of cleansing the body. But procedures, so panchakarma means you are doing all the five procedures together. What I want to really clarify, we can call something as panchakarma. Pancha means five. means procedure or action. So panchakarma means that all the five procedures together. Panchashodhana does not mean that you're doing all of them. In fact, if you bud from a person after doing all the panchakarmas, then you know that person might die. Because in a body and if you also remove the blood, then, you know, that person will not be able to sustain his life. So today, even if we apply oil and do a massage, you call it as panchakarma. So this is wrong. Pancha means five. And karma means procedure. So is this clear that you can call something as pancha karma only when you do all the five procedures together? If you don't do, if you do only one of them, then you are only doing shodhana. And sometimes you do only the preparatory procedures and then you cannot call it as pancha karma. So this is a big problem. People world over today, Panchakarma is being publicized in the wrong way. And if you apply some oil or if you do any simple procedure, oil or fermentation, then it is considered as Panchakarma. So the five procedures are emesis, purgation, nasal purge, decoction enema, and oil enema. So what is the difference between the, these two? Now, Panchashodhana is a classification. It just informs that there are five methods of cleansing the body, whereas Panchakarma is a procedure. It is a method of performing body cleansing as a program so that's the difference, really. Pancha karma is a program. And the important thing is, in pancha karma, four of the procedures are cleansing, and one procedure is nutritive. And this is really very important, because in our previous webinar, we discussed that in Ayurveda, we are always balancing metabolism and anabolism. Which means that if we overdo catabolism or if we overdo anabolism, then there will be imbalance. So Panchakarma is a balanced program in which, which is predominantly catabolic or cleansing, but it ends with a nutritive activity. So that is how the balance is happening. Because when you do too much of cleansing, Vata will aggravate. So the oil enema at the end will balance the vata. And instead of the oil enema, if you do bloodletting, you can imagine what will happen. The person has already lost a lot of body fluids, is extremely weak, and if you also remove blood, then there can be circulatory shock and the patient can be killed. So this is a very, very crucial importance and we are going to discuss today about Vamana, Virechana and the different types of Vastis which are done as part of Panchakar. Is this clear? Okay. So you know uh, because these are very intense uh, 
cleansing procedures. Just a moment, just a moment. Sorry, it was a technical interruption. Can you hear me? So now each of these procedures need preparation and also post-procedural care. Because none of these procedures can be done uh, just like that. You need to do some pre preparations. And these procedures also need to be done only in selected individuals. We need to screen them to see if they are fit for this. And so they have to be performed only after considering pros and cons. And another important thing is all these procedures require hospitalization. Compulsory hospitalization. Because when you perform them, there can be, uh, you know, problems. And we should never attempt to do this without the sufficient preparations and the precautions and facilities for handling complications. So this is the bottom line. When all five procedures are done together, we call this as panchakarma. And when all five panchakarmas are not performed, then we simply refer to the procedure as shodhana. So the preparatory procedures we already discussed. Before doing each of the panchakarma, we have to do snehana, which is foliation, and svedana, which is fermentation. And uh, snehana is usually done for seven days, and svedana for one day before the cleansing procedure. So if you want to induce emesis or purgation in any of your patients, then you have to prepare them for a week by giving snehapana. I hope you remember our discussion about snehapana. You know, we mentioned that we give ghee in large quantities. So this is done for seven days, and after that, the patient is subjected to fermentation, which is, uh, you know, sweating. And, and then after that, okay, yes, so I will explain very briefly. Yes, yes. So we, need, we will uh, give ghee in increasing doses, and sometimes up to 500 to 550, even 600 ml, of ghee is administered in one dose to the patient. Now, when you administer ghee in such heavy dose, then what happens is that uh, there is the precipitation of all the doshas all the doshas loosen up and they are ready to be removed from the system. So in order to make them very mobile, we have to then do svedana, which is heating of the body and fermentation. And once this is done, then the patient is ready for the cleansing procedure. So today we will first deal with Vamana and this procedure is what induces emesis. So here we induce emesis by the administration of emetic dance, drugs. And this is done basically to remove kapha from the system. When any disease has a predominance of kapha, then, and if we have to remove all the kapha from the body, then vamana or emphasis is the choice. Has any one of you seen this being done?
Okay. This is a slightly risky procedure, uh, which means that uh, you know you have to be a little cautious. This cannot be done in uh, people who suffer from heart diseases, people who suffer from any other serious illnesses. Such individuals, we cannot do this. Uh, so the patient will vomit. Uh, you, you know, a lot of uh, fluids and a lot of phlegm will actually be removed. In our hospital, which is a fairly new one, we just completed 1,000 Vamana procedures. Which means we just did uh, Vamana on 1,000 patients. Yeah, I mean, it is not so nice to see, but if you prepare the patient well, you know, then it's not much of a problem. The whole success of Vamana is related to the perfect, uh, you know, administration of Snehana and Svedana. If Snehana and Svedana is not done properly, then Vamana will create trouble. Hello? Hello, can you hear? Hello, can you hear? Okay, so if if there are problems for specifically one of you, then you know you can uh, please uh, please try to restart. So please, uh, okay, so this is uh, Vamana and there are many conditions in which uh, Vamana is indicated. So in the early stages of fever, very early stage, not when the fever becomes well established. Vamana, in especially if there are kapha-like symptoms, if we do Vamana, then we are able to prevent the fever from settling in. And uh, people who have loose bowels, tend to have loose bowels, then hemothermia, which is a kind of bleeding in the downward direction, People who have phthisis or, you know, wasting, then in skin diseases, diabetes, crofula tumors, filariasis, psychosis, cough, asthma. These are the Okay, so these are the conditions in which Vamana is indicated. So it's not just the disease. Actually, if you want to indicate Vamana, the primary thing is that the condition should be Kapha predominant. So if it is Kapha predominant, then we can do Vamana. If it is not Kapha predominant, then we shouldn't be doing Vamana. So this is the, you know, the underlying principle. And now we will look at the 
contraindications. So the contraindications are pregnancy, we should never do vomana in pregnancy, heart disease, when the, in the, if the body is extremely dry and there's strong hunger and there is extreme depression in these conditions, we cannot uh, do this. So, extreme depression, then children, old persons, obese persons, immediately after administration of vasti, when you have ascites, which is fluid in the abdomen, the flatulence and vata diseases, then, you know, we cannot, we cannot do this. Uh, Woman, it's this MSS is not indicated. So these are the indications and contraindications. And indigestion is a universal contraindication, which means if we have severe indigestion, weak digestive fire, uh, fire then all none of the cleansing procedures are indicated. They should all be avoided. So not only vamana, even vasti, even purgation, videchana any procedure that you do shouldn't be done when there is very severe indigestion. So in patients who have indigestion, we have to first treat that and improve their appetite and their digestive fire. And only when it reaches a, a, a certain level of functionality, only then you have to do the procedures. Because otherwise, even the procedures by themselves can reduce the capacity of the digestive fire and then cause problems. So this is a universal contraindication. So we found now which are the conditions in which can be recommended and which it cannot. So if you really look at that, you will realize that those conditions in which uh, Kapha is dominant, we can do Vamana. In those conditions in which Vata is dominant, we cannot do Vamana. So this is basically the, uh, the main criteria. Now we will look at the Vamana procedure as such. Um, the person who is posted for Vamana should be fed foods that will precipitate the doshas. So these kind of foods are fish, maybe the black lentils and sesame seeds and all this are administered. And after that, after all the foods are administered to precipitate the dosha, then we have to make the patient to drink milk or sugarcane juice and it should be drunk up to the level of the throat. Are you all able to hear? Okay, so I will continue. So you can make the patient to drink milk or sugarcane juice. It should be drunk till it comes to the throat and then you administer the medicines. And this procedure should always be done as early as possible. When we do Vamana in our hospital, we usually do it in the Kapakala or in the early mornings, even before sunrise.
And so this is how the procedure is done. And you know, there's a specific uh, fruit which is used for inducing vamana. And this is the species. I do not know whether you have even seen this or if it's available. Did anyone of you see this plant yet? So it has got a round ball like fruit. Okay, so this is called, in Sanskrit, it's called Madana Pala. So it's a very powerful emetic. In fact, in Ayurveda, we have discovered many plants which have this, this property. But this Madana Pala, is known to be the safest. So this is the most widely used plant. So anyway, this is for your understanding. Uh, it may not be immediately possible to implement these treatments, but in some diseases like psoriasis and, you know, lung bronchial asthma and such conditions without really uh, doing vamana and cleansing the body of excessive buildup of kapha, we will not actually get good clinical results. So vamana is a very, very important uh, clinical intervention. So if you get really very serious patients, it's even important that you are able to judge whether this case requires vamana or not. And then you could even refer to good Ayurvedic physicians even outside your country if, if the disease is serious and needs. So, now, there are other drugs also which are used as supportive emetic drugs, and I'm sure you must be knowing at least one of them. Can you recognize? Yes, Piper Longham, you know. And then? Yes, it should be possible to buy Glycerisa, yes. And Piper Longham are also available in the international market in some countries, but I do not know which. But of course, you cannot uh, do Vamana just with these two drugs. If you have the other drug, which is Madana Pala, then you can do it. But the problem is Madana Pala is an emetic, so it may not be permitted entry into some countries and its use may be restricted. So with the kind of study that we are doing, I will not uh, recommend that you try to do Vamana yourself. So this is only for understanding. So we will be discussing that these are some of the two or three main, main drugs that we are actually going to use in the procedure of Vamana. So now, Okay, so if you take glycerisa in large quantities, 
it can assist in vomiting. So now, no, we should not do in such conditions. So I told you this is not advised when you have trauma or any injury. This is advised only when in the body there is too much of kapha. There is too much of kapha accumulated in the body. Then you can use this. So please never use it in a case of injury. So after drinking the medicine, first we make the patient to drink milk. We normally in our hospital we give milk. We can also give sugarcane juice, which for us is not available throughout the year. So somebody posted. For Vamana, after drinking the medicine, should wait for 48 minutes. And if after that time, the patient should be allowed to avoid urine and bowels. And if the, if the patient feels any nausea or salivation, then you can induce emesis. So for the vomiting to start, some people need a stimulation. I mean, so for some people, even when they just take the medicine, the emesis will happen automatically. In some people, this does not happen. And if that doesn't happen, then you can use your fingers to irritate the throat or a soft probe can be used and you know you have to allow the vomit material to come out. So while the emesis is happening, the patient will be in some discomfort, but this is an emesis after body preparation. So patients uh, should be handled very carefully. They are very sensitive, very much aware and afraid of uh, you know, the consequences. So the patient should be gently caressed with the hands on the back, the sides, umbilicus and forehead. The attender should you know, gently stroke the patient in these regions and so that the process of emesis will not be very stressful and this process has to be continued this is a very important principle that uh, emesis is to be stopped only when bile is seen when bile starts coming out in fact you should allow the bile to come out even if you see a small so as I told, the main purpose of emesis is to remove phlegm. So when in, in most of the cases, like from my experience, if we are preparing the patient well and the constitution of the patient is favorable, then vamana is not a, a, a problem. It's done very smoothly and routinely. But in some cases, the medicine is not able to expel the medicine or the phlegm in a satisfying manner. So then we have to formulate long pepper, mustard, and salt water to induce further vomiting. There's a small problem with the slides. On my side, the slides are not moving. Just a moment.
So this is why I mentioned long pepper, mustard, and salt water. So these kind of combinations are given. And once you give this, vomiting gets induced. So just a moment, I'm trying to move the slides. It is not moving. Yes, so when, yes, I can see now, thank you. So when emesis happens properly, yes, yes. So when emesis happens properly, we can see that kapha, pitta, and vata will come out. And they are expelled one after the other without any difficulty. So first, when we examine what they are vomiting, you can see a lot of kapha. And then the next stage happens pitta, all the inflammation and uh, all those materials the body produces are removed and the third stage is vata which is extremely drying and the nervous system becomes very so there's also other aspects of psychological Improvement, which is experience of lightness, mental clarity, and uh, comfort. So when you see all these, uh, all these things need to be taken into consideration to decide whether the vamana has been done properly. So when you do this procedure, there is some immediate care that we have to offer to the patient. So one is that the patient should be comforted. The patient is likely to feel a little tired and there will be some lag of the process of vomiting that he has gone through. So you may find it difficult to sleep. But those things we have to actually uh, assist the patient throughout the procedure. So there will be a lot of secretions in the mouth and to dry up and clean the secretions the patient is advised to take three puffs of medicated smoke. So as this medicated uh, smoke actually reaches the nostrils then it clears the passages and all the secretions are arrested and inhibited. So this is a very important aspect of giving immediate care to the patient. So this is really emphasized. And finally, the patient should be on lifestyle and diet regimen. In fact, immediately after the cleansing procedure, the patient has to follow some strict dietary guidelines. So this is the immediate care that we have to offer to a patient who has uh... So now we come to diet after a procedure of vamana or virechana the digestion becomes weak so this is one of the major outcomes of doing a cleansing procedure. Immediately after the cleansing procedure, the digestion becomes weak. Now we have to increase the digestion after the procedure. So it is compared, you know, just like the spark of a flame is fanned to become a blazing fire, the digestive capacity of the individual is enhanced gradually by these procedures. So this is a very important step 
post woman huh? so the uh, patients are asked to take thin rice gruel first the thick rice gruel soups these things are administered one after the other depending on the digestive capacity of the patient and uh, this is very crucial to rebuild the immunity. I mean, the patient shouldn't go immediately to, you know, hotel food or such other foods that are made outside. But they should cook in their own. So that's about diet, general guidelines about diet. And now there are some other important points to decide. Number of vomits. This should be counted to know whether the procedure that you performed was accurate, correct, or fruitful. So in order to know that, you have to really count the number of vagas the person had. So even this if you if your vomiting process has been correctly then you get a superior outcome and the superior outcome means that the patient vomited eight times so this is also an indication if the patient starts vomiting more than eight times then you have to be careful because it might be leading to other problems so a moderate vomana is one in which the patient vomits for at least six times. And when the outcome is inferior, then the patient vomits only four times. So when you are counting these, you cannot count the first uh, expulsion because in the first expulsion the medicines are expelled so you must eliminate that and then count how many vomits the patient had and this number of vomits can give you an index of how effective was your vomit procedure so when you have done these procedures you must always check You know, always check whether the procedure has been done properly. So now since many of these cases, uh, you know, you have to monitor and constantly monitor in order to prevent uh, the complications. So this is in brief vamana that you know the patient is first made to undergo snehana and svedana, then he is given all kinds of foods which will cause precipitation of the doshas. And after the precipitation of the doshas, we are giving milk or sugarcane juice and the patient drinks this to the full and then takes the medicine and then puts the fingers or some soft object to tickle the throat so that the vomiting starts. And once the vomiting starts, we have to Uh, induce the vomiting and count we have to specify the patient count the number of times the patient has vomited and make sure that there are signs of proper emesis and there's nothing that goes unnoticed so this is the protocol in brief for doing emesis so is this clear
Okay, any questions? Do you think you will be able to do this procedure? Okay, I was just joking. I mean, I wouldn't imagine that you will try to do this procedure after this brief lecture because there are many things to be looked into and some patients with hidden diseases, this can be a real, real problem. So now we will go to the next procedure, which is purgation. So the virajana or purgation is the process through which medicated herbs are administered through the oral route and these cause strong purgation. So a lot of people today are trying to understand purgation and uh, the pharmacology behind purgation and MSL and there are drugs and herbs which will induce this process but the real success of both MSL and purgation lies in the preparatory procedure. So again we have to do oleation and fermentation before doing purgation. So this is again an important thing many people think that by taking a purgative they can cleanse their body but this is not true we cannot cleanse our body just by purgation so we cannot cleanse our body just by purgation Purgation can cleanse a body in which already the waste has been mobilized. So purgation helps only if the wastes have been mobilized. So that is the key thing. So even in Virajana, before administering the medicine, we have to prepare the patient. So even before that, we have to choose the patient. All patients or all people are not fit to do Virajana. So here are the conditions in which Virajana can be done. So if people who have, uh, uh, you know, flatulence in the stomach, people who have hemorrhoids, and people who have uh, you know skin eruptions jaundice chronic fever ascites i hope you know what is ascites so there are some technical terms which i couldn't find an exact uh, you know equivalent uh, in english so it's actually you know the fluids retention in the abdominal region that's what is ascites so, so the this all these kinds of diseases we can do virajana in abscess if you do proper virajana the abscess will heal faster and uh, so and for all these diseases we have to understand the principle i mean why they are indicated and not indicated but it's beyond the scope to go into a very very detailed uh, discussion so diabetes tumors filariasis 
And an important thing is if Vamana is indicated for Vata, then Virechana is indicated actually for Pitta. So this is a major difference. So by doing Virechana, we effectively we are able to remove Pitta from the system. Whereas by doing Vamana or emesis, we are able to pacify Kapha. So Vamana is for Kapha, Virechana is for Pitta, and Vasti is for Vata. And there are two types of Vasti. And actually the one specific for Vata Pitta and Kapha are in a ghee for Pitta. So Vamana is given when there is Kapha and Virechana when there is Pitta. Now there are contraindications for Virechana. We should not give Virechana or purgation when the, during the early stage of fever when there is digestion is weak because all the equipments and you know instruments so big digestive fire diarrhea then after administering decoction enema then when you have constipated bowels, if there is injury to the rectum and there is hemothermia or hot blood and if it's moving the downward direction, these are all the conditions. And if the person has undergone excessive snehapana or oil therapy, and then we are not supposed to do virechana. So in all these conditions, virechana is contraindicated. So this is the first step, wherever you are planning to do a, a Ayurvedic treatment, you have to first of all decide whether the person is eligible to do this procedure. So after the proper emesis has been done, the patient should again be subjected to Snehana and Svedana. These procedures should be repeated again and only when sub the doshas have been sub substantially provoked only then we can do vidation. So here to induce vidation we need medicines and these medicines can be administered on the day of the vidation after the kapha period. So when you are doing Vedasana, you can give the medicine in Pitta period. But when you are doing Vamana, you have to give the medicine in the Kapha period, which is actually very early. So I know in our hospital and many other surrounding areas, you know, we do Vedasana only in the Pitta Kala. I mean, we do not do this in the Kapha Kala. So is this clear? Has anybody tried out purgation or laxative? Uh, so I'm sure you, many of you, or most of you have not done or seen Vamana, but have you seen purgation? Yeah, what do you use? Which medicine do you use for purgation? Ah, that is for Snehapana. But to induce purgation, you have to take some other medicine. Uh, do you okay so some people use tripala tripala is a laxative but in ayurveda these are not the medicines that are used for virechana so there is a plant called operculina terpitum which is considered to be the best medicine for purgation this is called in sanskrit as trivrit And this is the drug of choice for inducing virechana. I, I don't know whether you have 
uh, heard or seen operculina terpetum but using the botanical name you can maybe search on the google and find so the flower of this plant is funnel shaped because it belongs to the convolvulaceae family and the roots are actually used for vidation So this medicine is made into a powder and it's mixed with, uh, you know, you can mix it with jaggery or honey. Usually honey is not advised when you are doing a strong panchakarma. For vidagenite is not advised, whereas for vamanite is advised. And you can even mix this in hot water and administer and it will produce the purgation. So we have to check the nature of the bowel. There are some people whose bowels are extremely sensitive that even if you give them milk, they will have purgation. Some of them are very sensitive to milk. I hope you know about lactose intolerance. Yes, in some uh, such people, I mean, we have to be careful. Their bowels are very sensitive and they may overreact. So we have to check. So some people, the dose of a medicine depends on the nature of the bowels of the patient. And in previous webinars, we have discussed also about, you know, how we have to decide on a case-by-case -case basis what type of treatment and what type of medicine and intervention are required for each individual. So this is about the nature of the bowels. And then we have facilitation of the region. So when you are doing vamana and if there is a problem, if the patient is not able to throw up, then you have to, you know, stroke the patient's back and sides of his body and pacify him and then administer some herbs. But when you have taken a purgative and if you want the purgation to happen without interruption, then you have to make the patient to drink hot water. So drinking hot water is the best way to facilitate the regina or purgation. The another option is that you can heat your palms, just rub your palms together and then the palms will become heated and that heated palm you can actually, you know, place on the umbilicus of the patient and his, then his uh, stomach becomes or his abdomen becomes warm then there will be more and more induction of uh, Vidachana. So this is the way Vidachana is induced and this is a very, very important cleansing procedure. And as I was mentioning, this is very, very crucial for the removal of Pitta from the system. So this is the way Virechana is done and then when you have Virechana completion, you know, these are not very nice procedures. You can imagine you have to count the number of times the patient moves his bowels and the number of times he vomits 
So this is a really uh, very uncomfortable procedure, but so important to cleanse the body and in chronic diseases to rid the body of unwanted material. So when you give medicines, you know, in a patient who is strong and in a patient who has a lot of unwanted waste materials accumulated inside the body, uh, the patient will go to the toilet and will void for up to 30 times. You can just imagine 30 times a patient will be, you know, uh, purgating. And a mediocre purgation happens, then it is 20 times. And inferior purgation is 10 times. So this is on the basis of the number of times the bowel moves. You can see whether you had achieved an inferior virechana or a mediocre virechana or a superior virechana. So I just want to ask a question. How many of you have done purgation on yourselves or on others? Because if you have done, I'd just like to ask out of curiosity, how many times did you move the bowels or did the person you had, who, whom you administered, how many times did they move the bowels? You have an experience? Okay, so did you take any medicine? How many times did your bowels move? Okay, that's interesting. So, you know, uh, if a patient uh, voids for 30 times and if the patient is not strong enough, then this can lead to complications like dehydration. Now, it's important to know that compared to other procedures in Ayurveda, both Vamana and Virechana can cause complications if we are not careful. So that's very important to know. And these complications can also mean death. Patients can also die if you are not careful. So when, when you have done proper Vamana or emesis, you know, at the end, we can see bile. And when we do purgation, then at the end, we can see phlegm. So this is a very important sign to understand whether the purgation that we have done is satisfactory or not. Uh, when we do emesis, at the end of the, as the patient vomits, the last vomit will bring out some yellow substance and that will be bile. And if it comes, we can be sure, yes, this is now a perfect, you know, uh, procedure. And when you are doing purgation, if at the end, if there is phlegm, and then we can know that this purgation has been done, uh, you know, perfectly. So this is the difference between the two procedures. And as I was mentioning, there are many complications that might come when you are doing these procedures. So, if sometimes the purgation is not satisfactory. So, if the patient passes bowels only three or four times, then there's always a heavy feeling in the stomach. There will be nausea, there will be itching, there is body heat, and sometimes skin eruptions will come. There's nasal discharge and then constipation. So, these are all uh, signs which indicate that the purgation has not been done satisfactorily. And in this condition, we have to induce further purgation 
later. Otherwise, the doshas which are provoked can lead to further problems. Uh, when the retina is done, done satisfactorily, the outcome can be also new diseases. The patients might later develop skin problems or some other diseases that affect the marmas. On the other hand, if the purgation is too strong and there's excessive purgation, then we can see conditions like bleeding and then rectal prolapse and then you will also see signs of dehydration and as I was mentioning there can also be death. So that is the reason. So this is very important. I wanted to tell you that this is not just laxative. It's purgative. Which means there's a drastic removal of wastes from the body. And it's because of that that we need adequate preparation of the patient and the expert doctors and people uh, able to do emergency care should be present while the uh, procedure is being done. And that's really very, very important. So then we go on to proper Virechana. So if Virechana is done correctly, then you will see lightness of the body. There is mental clarity and reduction in intensity of the disease. And when this is seen, then we can know that proper Virechana has happened. So in our hospitals, we are uh, having to do a lot of observation. So it's not just that the patient has purgation, we have to ensure that these signs are present. And you know, after every procedure, the agni will become weak. So after the procedure is done, we have to again activate the agni. And so we have to put the regulated diet. So there we have, will give the rice gruel, and uh, you know, then the thick gruel and the soups are given, and it takes some time before the patient is brought back to normal diet. So there can also be complications if we, after the procedures are done, you are, if you directly make the patient immediately to go on to normal food and diet, then this can lead to complications. So we discussed mainly about two procedures now, Vamana and Virechana. And uh, this is, it was discussed because it's part of Panchakarma. And this is not discussed because you will be able to do it, but it's important that you're knowing about it because it's such an important procedure in Ayurveda. So although you cannot do it, it's important that you understand that these these procedures may be required in some patients uh, who have chronic diseases and without such drastic cleansing the patient may not be able to get good recovery. So that's the importance of knowing this. So now there's another point that the pharmacology of Vamana and Virechana Vamana or emesis, the medicines act even before it is digested. So the action of emetics are immediate. Like the moment you drink the emetic drug, you will feel the urge to vomit. But when you are giving a medicine for virechana, it is not like that. Because when you give a medicine for virechana, you have to wait for a few hours before the medicine works which means the Virechana medicines or the purgatives are getting digested and it is in the process of being digested that they are actually acting. So this is a big difference. Uh, the emetic drugs act immediately and the purgative drugs act very slowly. So this is the two differences. And with that, 
we have come to end of these two procedures. So I think we will have a break now for about 10 to 12 minutes. And then we will, uh, you know, come back. Here now, can you hear me? Okay. So now <clears throat> we are going to discuss in the remaining time about the the other important panchakarma, which is vasti. So have you all heard about vasti? Yes. Have you experienced it? Has anybody done it, or on yourself, or on somebody else? Okay, so that's great. So, yeah. Uh, vasti is something which you could still do in your uh, place. Uh, there are some types of vastis which can be easily done, so that I will discuss. Unlike Vamana and Virechana, which we can only understand theoretically, and we might not be able to do it. Whereas vasti is something that you can also perform in a limited way. So, vasti is actually the administration of medicine through the rectal root. So, although it looks, it sounds very similar to the modern procedure of enema, I mean, it's quite different. This, the similarity is very superficial. The actual procedure is, uh, you know, different in its action and its purpose. And that we will begin to understand, and also in its complexity. But yes, if you look at it from a very gross point of view, we can say that both uh, enema and vasti appear to be very similar, you know, at the surface. It's just administering medicines through the rectum. So vasti is the procedure for administering liquid medicines through the rectal root. And basically there are two types of vasti. The decoction enema known as niruha vasti and uh, oil enema known as anuvasana vasti. So are you aware of this broad classification of vastis? That there are actually two types of vasti. One is done with decoctions, and this difference is really very, very important, as we will realize in the course of our discussion. One is decoction vasti, and the other is oil vasti. So vasti is administered in two ways. And there's also a third way of vasti, which is given through the genitalia. And this is called as uttara vasti. So are you aware of this difference between, you know, the different types of vasti? This is really very, very important. And comparatively, if you look at niruha vasti, is the most dangerous of all. Decoction enema. So amongst these enemas, it's decoction enema which is a bit tricky and which can be risky and if you're not careful then decoction enema can also lead to death we will come to that later but the other types of enemas are actually not so problematic they do not cause life-threatening situations we know that vamana can cause death virechana can cause death 
and now Niruhavasti can also cause death. So these three procedures are the most dangerous uh, in the Panchakarmas and require a lot of precaution, care, and you know expertise to be able to get good outcomes. Now where do we give Vasti? What is the purpose of Vasti? So we know that Vamana is indicated for Kapha and Virechana is indicated for Pit. And so it follows and it's naturally you could have guessed now that Vasti is for Vata. So we actually give Vasti when we need to specify Vata. So in diseases where Vata is dominant, or in diseases which are caused exclusively by Vata, this is where we will actually administer Vasti. And Vasti is considered to be the most superior amongst all treatments for the same reason. Because we know Vata is that which controls all other doshas, it is that which controls all the dhatus. And therefore, a treatment with which we bring Vata into control, it is said to be half of all the treatments. Because if Vata is specified, then half of the battle is already won. So this is the key thing. Now, there are the conditions in which we can administer Vasti, and these are flatulence. Vasti is very good for normalizing the peristalsis and the normal activities of the intestines. It's a very powerful treatment in rheumatoid arthritis. In all the conditions where Vata is dominating, at the appropriate stage of treatment, we have to do Vasti. It's helpful in splenomegaly, it's helpful in the chronic stages of fever, in the late stages when there's joint pain and other problems. So it's also helpful in chronic diarrhea in which the intestines become very weak and there's a tendency for hypermotility. It's helpful in conditions like rhinitis, in the stage where vata is dominant. So in all these diseases, the underlying principle is that vasti is effective when vata is dominating. That's the key thing. So in constipation, in urinary stones, when we give vasti, then the ureters uh, begin to have better mobility and its ability to push the stone outside will be better. Then in amenorrhea, which is again due to the blockage of vata, this is very effective. And then in all severe vata diseases, Vasti is found to be effective and is recommended as a line of treatment. So is this clear? Now there are also many uh, conditions in which Vasti is not advised. So Vasti cannot be given in many conditions, uh, asthma, cough, hemorrhoids, hiccup, weak digestive fire, ascites, again we discussed about ascites and in ascites actually purgation is the 
line of treatment and vasti is not indicated purgation in fact emaciated means that the patient has become extremely thin there is loss of muscle uh, and there is uh, weight loss and then also that the patient uh, is just like you know skin and bones So those who have uh, severe vomiting and in the earlier stages of diarrhea and then immediately after cleansing procedures we cannot do vasti and in pregnancy up to seven months of pregnancy vasti is contraindicated and in fact if you do vasti in these stages of pregnancy you can also provoke miscarriage and abortion so this is uh, not allowed. So in skin diseases, generally vasti is not allowed. And if the digestive fire is very weak, then it is not allowed. When there is severe hiccup, it is not allowed in hemorrhoids. In hemorrhoids, vasti can actually cause uh, problems. It can uh, injure the pile mass. So these are the major conditions in which, uh, you know, vasti is actually not indicated. So these are contraindications and indications. And out of this, you know, as I was mentioning, please keep this in mind that there are two types of vastis. And these are the decoction and oil enema. So what we discussed so far are the common indications and contraindications for both decoction and oil enema. But now I'm going to talk about the special indications for oil enema. And these are very strong digestive fire and uh, you know extremely dry state of the tattoos and exclusive vata imbalance hello can you hear me hello can you hear me okay fine that's fine Okay, so is, uh, is so far everything clear? Did you all hear my previous discussions? So we were discussing about the indications and contraindications of, uh, okay, fine, of uh, the oil enema or which is otherwise called as Sneha Basti. Oh yeah, the last thing I was mentioning about elephant leg syndrome. So the elephant leg disease in which the, uh, you know, the legs become swollen and the fluid, the lymph drainage is affected and the legs of the patients will become really big like elephants. This is a disease that is spread by mosquito bites in places where there is a lot of water logging. Some parts of Kerala, the state in which I live, there is this problem. <clears throat> um, but nowadays, uh, people are more aware and they are taking uh, preventive measures. And this disease can also be controlled well if we are diagnosing it in very early stages. But in late stages, it can be a real problem. And uh, since you asked about filaria, so this is one of the diseases in which an integrative medicine protocol has been developed and Ayurveda is helping very much in the advanced stages of this disease. So a uh, dermatologist in Kerala has worked along with a physician from the UK, an allopathic doctor and they developed a very beautiful treatment plan and using this treatment people are able to get very good improvement 
the yes, leg swelling becomes reduced to more than half, they're able to move around. And so Ayurveda also has very good treatment for filariasis. But of course, oil enema is something which we should completely avoid when you are treating this disease. Now, when you want to do Vasti, you need a special apparatus for doing Vasti. So has anybody seen the classical Yes, it is contraindicated because in lung problems when there is intra-abdominal pressure can, uh, you know, aggravate breathing problems. A good question. See, when you are, you, are, you are pushing a lot of fluid from the intestine into the abdomen and this will cause a lot of pressure on the diaphragm and this can put pressure on the lungs. And so the patients will feel lung congestion and discomfort and that's the reason why it is contraindicated. So any, any treatment which will increase uh, intra-abdominal pressure is not good for people with lung disease. I mean, they will find it uh, very difficult. Now we need to discuss about the apparatus for Vasti. No, that is why I told from the beginning, this is very different from normal enema. Coffee enema is not advised by Ayurveda. It is harmful, according to Ayurveda. So our enema, Avasti, is not the enema that is popularly done today. It's very different. And if you look at the, is this clear? So at the outset, I clarified that Ayurvedic enema is very different. The purpose is different. The materials used are different. The protocols are different. The outcomes are different. Today, people are doing all kinds of, OK, in which condition? So cancer is a totally different condition. I mean, cancer is a, a disease which we treat with poisons. So it's not a normal condition. So, you know, in cancer, you may get some partial results. Uh, so that's the nature. Yes, yes. But coffee can also harm liver if overused because it's extremely hot. So in my opinion, we have to be very careful when we use these kinds of enemas. Okay. Yeah, well, you can decide because I will tell you now today the principles of how enema is used in Ayurveda. And then, you know, what is its purpose? Because, you know, coffee in Ayurveda, the purpose of enema is for vata. You know, coffee 
has nothing to do with wada. Uh, Ayurvedic vasti will specify vata. Coffee will not specify vata. Is this clear? So that's a big difference between coffee enema and Ayurvedic vasti. You know, both are entirely different. The purpose is very different. So, you know, we have to use those substances very, very carefully. Uh, because uh, in Ayurveda, the whole vasti is designed to stabilize vata. And the intestine is the seat of vata. So if you, if you put substances which will disturb vata, then in the long run it can produce problems. So we have to be careful. But in cases like cancer, things are different. We can do some drastic treatments in cancer. Even modern treatments of radiation, chemotherapy, they're all poisons. If you give any of those treatments to normal human beings, they will die. And they may also get very serious diseases like cancer and other problems. So now, has anybody seen the Ayurvedic uh, apparatus for doing vasti? Okay, so the apparatus for vasti consists of two components. Administrate a tube like structure, and this is called Vasti Netra. And then we have the bag called Vasti, which is the, uh, you know, the, the, the something which holds the Vasti fluid. Yes, we can see. We can see and decide. I will show you some pictures. So, you know, the Vasti Netra or the administrator was actually made out of metal, typically bronze and the brass and the the bag for holding the fluid in olden days urinary bladder of animals were used you know it was all cleaned and dried and made into a leather bag so it's a kind of leather bag that was used in olden days so we will see the picture now. In India nowadays, a lot of people use syringes and uh, other things. But traditionally, you can see here, this is the administrator. This is a traditional one. But nowadays, we are using modern devices. So these are very different. So traditionally, this is the the administrator and here we will have a, a ball like structure which is usually taken from the urinary bladder of animals and now nobody is using it so I also do not have a, a picture So you can see now there is adaptation. People are using modern devices to administer the vasti. And as I told, here in vasti, the focus is specifically for specifying vata. The, in panchakarma, we are stabilizing all the three doshas. We remove kapha with uh, vamana. 
then we remove pitta with vivechana and then we stabilize uh, you know vata with vasti so this is the three stages so vasti that's the logic of all the three procedures are interlinked and the focus is on the three doshas so this is the so do you use similar kind of material Do you all also use similar sub materials or is it different? So yeah, so that's good. So then, you know, the Vasti is one procedure which you can, you know, also apply uh, in your place. So it's good to know that you would be able to do it. So I will tell you also what type of enema you can give. So now I want to ask you, when you give this enema, okay, good. So in Ayurveda, when we do the enema, it has to be administered at once. Not little by little. That's an important thing. So you can see here now, the two types of enema, they have two different dosages. Now, the decoction enema, the maximum dosage is 1200 ml. So you can see it's just a little over one liter. So one liter in decoction enema, one liter of material is ingested into the into the elementary tract. That's quite a lot of material. Whereas when you give oil enema, the maximum dose is only 300 ml. So let me ask, when you are giving enema, what is the quantity of fluids that you are using? How much fluid will you give? How much quantity did you do you give? Do you also give uh, such high doses sometimes? You mean more than a liter? Okay. Okay, great. Right. So, so that's experience in giving these quantities. So now, how do we administer vasti? So we look at these procedures. First, we must do oleation and fermentation again because all the surfaces, all the channels, should become open and uh, you know patent. So when you apply oil and do fermentation, then they become very much open. And first we have to give oil enema. So this is a very important concept in Ayurveda. In order to prevent imbalances and problems, we always give oil enema and decoction enema together. If we give decoction enema alone, then it can cause vata imbalances. 
Now this can be a problem also with coffee anema. If you give it to many people in many conditions. So one of the ways to prevent imbalance is to first give, first do fermentation and uh, you know all, uh, apply oil around the umbilicus and the back and the legs and then give very good fermentation. And then you give oil enema. So after this is done, the patient should be made to lie on a flat bed onto his left side. Then the right knee is flexed and the vasti is administered through the rectal root. So this is the way, you know, the uh, vasti is administered. So first we give oiling, then we do fermentation, and then we give, uh, uh, and to give oil enema first, the patient is to lie down on a flat bed, turn to the left side, then flex the right knee, and then the rectal root, the medicine is administered. So this is the procedure and the protocol. So immediately after the vasti has been administered, the patient should lie in the back and then, you know, flex his thighs and uh, uh, knees and gently, firmly hit the buttocks of the patient with the heels. So this is to make sure that, you know, the oil that has been administered does not come out immediately. Uh, we need to keep the oil inside for a little while. And so there's a gentle punching that is done and then the oil remains inside and then the patient become, is kept like that for as long as it's possible. And when the urge comes to evacuate, the patient is allowed to evacuate and the oil will uh, come out. So this is the post-procedural protocol that is followed when we are doing uh, vasti. So again, I would like to ask, when you administer Vasti, what is your experience? Do the liquids come out immediately? Or do they stay inside for some time? Hello, can you hear? Can you hear? Okay, anyway, Shishasana is not advised. So, you know, we need to keep the oil inside for some time. And this is the procedure. And then, after the oil has come out and the patient has good appetite, light food is given in the evening. So, in this case, in some people, the oil may not come out easily. Uh, ideally, the oil should come out within 12 hours. We shouldn't allow the oil to remain inside for more than, you know, 12 hours. And um, after two years, the oil does it. Then we have to use suppositories to remove the oil. So there are many theories, and a lot of studies have been done to find out how these 
I, I, the vasti actually works. So you know there are many many receptors inside the gut and now it is being realized that when you apply this uh, oil inside these receptors are getting stimulated and then they uh, produce a trigger of events which leads to hormonal and other chemical changes. So there are some theories. There are other theories which also say that the gut microbes, the gut microbe changes when we do the vasti. So there are many, many uh, theories nowadays put forth for understanding how vasti works. And there was one very good study that was done by a group of uh, researchers in Mumbai and they found that when you administer vasti uh, then you know there are some changes in the bio yes and then they found that there are also changes in many blood parameters immunological responses were also uh, also seen when vasti was administered. So now some interesting research is beginning to throw light on the possible ways in which vasti could be acting. So further studies are of course required to follow this up. So now when the oil has come out, then the patient should be put on some simple light diet. And you know, this is very important according to Ayurveda that when all these procedures are done, after each procedure, agni or digestion is expected to become weak. So when Agni or digestion becomes weak, then we have to build it up with a proper diet. And so that's the reason why after all these procedures, we have to give great care to balance the diet of the patient. So this is that procedure. And then before giving any dry decoction enema, we have to repeat the oil enema. This is another procedure that the intestines should, their motility, the vata of the intestine should be stabilized before we give decoction enema. And this is what makes Ayurvedic vasti different from modern types of enema, where we do not find this balancing between oil and decoction. So when you give, first we have to give oil enema. And this oil enema is repeated on the third and fifth days. And for people who are very active and who are constipated, oil enema is administered almost every day. So we administer this enema repeatedly till the intestines become, you know, uh, oily and it becomes really well oleated. And when this is done, uh, only after that the decoction enema, which is dry enema, is actually administered. Is this clear? Yeah, I just want to uh, highlight the difference of Vasti as done in Ayurveda. The procedural differences. So, yeah, different types of enema have their own effects. But the Ayurvedic conceptual approach is slightly different. So it's important to know how it is different from what is done normally.
So then we have the administration of decoction enema. So after the oil enema is administered three or four times, decoction enema may be administered for cleansing the surface. So No, no, actually that is the thing, you know, there's a big principle of water balance. So if we don't follow these principles, you know, when you do large numbers, in few numbers you may not find big differences or it's like in our hospital we are doing thousands, ten thousands of vastis, you know, in, in, in few months. So there's so many patients coming and some people will have unwanted reactions and problems. So in Ayurveda we have made uh, very elaborate protocols that we administer oil enema three or four times and make sure that water is stabilized and then only decoction enema because both action are opposite. So this is usually done in the afternoon, you know, the decoction enema is to be given only in the afternoon, so it cannot be given in any other time of the day. And this is also done after oleation and fermentation, and then this is done after evacuating the bowels, so this is done on empty stomach, whereas oil enema is done on a full stomach. So this is the difference between the two types of enemas. And this is done when the patient is not too hungry, whereas uh, oil enema can be done when the patient is very hungry. So this complementarity of doing two vastis together to balance each other, in fact in Ayurveda everything is balance, catabolism and anabolism. Everything is balanced. So even panchakarma is a balance. So you do four procedures of cleansing and then you stabilize it with, you know, So, decoction enema should also be done with the presence of other experts because that's a key thing that So is this clear? Okay. Now we have to look at how the decoction enema is prepared. Now this is a very elaborate procedure of mixing substances. You know, you need honey, rock salt, oil, 
paste and decoction. These are four ingredients that are needed to make what is called as a decoction enema. And we need to use them in specific proportions. And first we mix honey and rock salt together and then mix them, grind them so well that the salt is completely dissolved in the honey. Now this is a very important principle. The rock salt will open up all the channels inside the body and the honey will actually uh, dry up the mucosa and prevent too much of phlegm from blocking. So this is a, uh, uh, this, this combination actually helps to create the pathway for the medicines to get absorbed into the body. So that's the important thing here. And then we add the oil and after adding the oil we will again grind it well so that you know an emulsified mixture is produced. And this takes some hours, some time to actually prepare. Can you hear me? Hello, can you hear me? Okay, 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 okay. Yes, great. So is this clear? We mix honey, rock salt, we grind it well, then we add oil and then we grind it well, and then we add paste and then we grind it well, and then we add decoction and we grind it well. And when all these things are mixed well, it becomes, you know, a, an emulsion kind of thing. And this is called as the decoction enema. So then, after we administer the decoction enema, There are some protocols to be followed. These are medicinal herbs. So there are, that you can change according to the condition of the patient. So in different diseases we will use combination of different herbs actually to do this procedure. So and so also the decoction will change from patient to patient and according to the condition. Now after applying the uh, enema, I mean after administering the enema, the patient has to lie in the supine position and flex the thighs and knees and then when the urge comes to defecate the bowels should be evacuated by sitting in a squatting position. So compared to the oil enema the decoction enema does not stay inside for long. It comes out very quickly and we say that it shouldn't remain for long. So it should not stay for more than 48 hours. That's a very important thing. I mean 48 minutes, I'm sorry, not 48 hours. If it stays for more than 48 hours, then it can lead to complications. 
and we say that even death can happen. So if it remains inside for long, we have to quickly do some other procedures to make sure that it is removed. And because the quantity is quite high, it's about 1 to 1.2 liters, so the patient cannot also hold it inside for long. So when you apply, since you are all, yeah, yeah, I'm sorry, I made a mistake. It was a typo. Yes. And since you are uh, also doing it, what is your observation? How long does the person hold this back? Ten minutes, okay, that's fine. So that's safe, great. So this is the overall procedure and protocol. And if the decoction enema does not come out within 48 minutes, then very strong, as I was mentioning, provocative enema should be administered. We can also, yes, even 15 minutes is very safe. So that's quite fairly good enough time. And strong suppositories should also be administered to evacuate the bowels so that the material is coming out very quickly. So all these things should be kept ready beforehand. And so that, you know, this is... So this is the evacuation of decoction enema in case it stays inside longer than it is expected to do. Now here is the quantity of the ingredients. Now this is this is the key thing, the proportion, which actually, you know, this is something which Ayurveda has developed over centuries of experience. You need 192 ml of grams of honey, 15 grams of rock salt, and 288 grams of the oil. 96 grams of the paste and 384 grams of the decoction and other ingredients if you are adding some additional you know supportive ingredients like powders then they can be up to a maximum of 192 grams so this is how the overall total becomes approximately 1200 ml so this proportion is very crucial if we change the proportions then it, even the vasti uh, fluids will not actually, you know, mix well. It's even difficult to make them mix well. So this is the quantity of the ingredients. And I will move further. So. We repeat this vasti several times, second time, third time, fourth time. One administration is not enough. So you are expecting some endpoints to be achieved with the vasti. And until those symptoms are seen, the pacification of vada, the reduction in the symptoms of the disease, and such uh, features, we have to repeat the vasti. So this is the procedure that we follow, the number of vastis. And the key principle here is that the oil and decoction enema are complementary. After application of decoction enema, the patient should be immediately subjected to oil enema. So the signs of proper administration of oil enema are similar to that of oleation. This is the ancient Indian system of weights 
and measures. It is described in the Ayurvedic texts. So this is an important thing. When you apply decoction enema, then it should be immediately followed by oil enema. If you don't balance it, then there can be bata imbalance and all kinds of unwanted symptoms and problems. So they should be always given together. So this is the key important principle to be kept in mind. Now we should also be aware of the effects of excessive Vasti administration. What will it happen if you overdo Vasti? You give too many Vastis. So if you give too much of oil enema, then it can cause precipitation and weakening of the digestive fire. So we have to, we cannot tell that in every individual we have to give so many numbers of oil enema or so many numbers of uh, decoction enema. These numbers and the quantity, all this varies according to the individual's strength, the nature of the disease, and tolerance limits. So if we overdo this, then oil enema can cause a precipitation of doshas and the weakening of the digestive fire. And if you do too much of decoction enema, then there will be aggravation of vata. Exactly, exactly. Because we are trying to protect Vata. So Niruha, the purpose of de uh, decoction enema is to cleanse and clear. You know, probably coffee is also doing something similar. I would compare coffee enema is like decoction enema. So this is where you can use some Ayurvedic principles. You can you can improve coffee enema by you know mixing it with uh, honey and a little uh, rock salt and paste and oil and then the decoction. Then coffee enema can be made more balanced. So, uh, so with this principle, that is why I wanted to explain, like the different types of enema that you are doing there, you can understand it. I mean, today we are only discussing some general principles of, uh, you know, enema. Uh, in Ayurveda, enemas are classified in many more complex ways, but it's beyond our webinar and this course to go into all those details. So the benefit of learning that is that, you know, it will give you an idea of how to make enemas more balanced. So coffee enema will also, is like a decoction enema. So if you are going to apply oil before and after, then you can prevent side effects. So the problem is not just with coffee enema as such, but the way it is administered according to Ayurveda. It's very, very drying, very strong. And so in some individuals, it can cause imbalances. That is the Ayurvedic, uh, you know, uh, principle. So neither should be administered in excess. So I will also, before we conclude, show some interesting methodologies in which, uh, you know, these enemas are applied together. Now the quantum of oil enema. How many times can you give oil enema? If it is kapha dominant, you can give one or three times. If it is pitta dominant, we give five or seven times. If it's vata dominant, we give nine or eleven times. So this is the quantum of oil enema that is applied. And our classification based on action. 
So, some of the enemas are cleansing. Some can precipitate the doshas. Some others can normalize the doshas. So, the action of the enemas are actually differing. So, this is also another principle. Whenever you are giving enema with various substances, you can also think and classify them into those that can precipitate, those that can cleanse, and those that can normalize. So in this way, enemas also, you know, function in different ways. So it's really important to know in what way it is actually acting and effecting. So this is about the classification of enemas. There are special types of vastis recommended. So these are called as picha vastis. So we use certain uh, herbs which are extremely soothing and which will not cause any irritation. In colitis we cannot do any of these vastis. It will cause tremendous irritation. So one of the substance that is used is a gum. Yes, exactly. It's an anti-inflammatory vasti. So we have certain recipes for that which can be used. And generally such vastis are called picha vastis. They are actually a variant. But it's uh, we cannot discuss that today because it's a bit, uh, you know, out of our topic. It's a kind of an advanced topic. And uh, you need to learn a lot of herbs uh, before you can uh, because it's very formula specific so there is a herb called salmelia malabarica and this herb there is a paste that we get from this herb this is actually used to uh, you know prepare this special type of vasti so it can be done but we have to be very very careful So this is a general introduction about different types of vastis and now I want to discuss about a, a simple type of vasti which is called as a small dose enema. This is a kind of vasti that we can apply in our day-to-day, -day, you know, activities. So the vasti administered with the smallest dose of snehapana is called matra vasti. And this can be administered without any restrictions. It is advisable for children, old people, those who are emaciated, weak, and so on. And 150 ml is an optimal dose. So you can give this vasti in very small doses. You can even give 50 ml per day. So this type of vasti, which is called matra or small dose, very dose dependent, small dose enema, can be administered without any restrictions. It can be administered every day if necessary. And in people who are having constipation, this type of enema is very helpful because it doesn't is not habit forming. It's better than laxatives. Laxatives can be more problematic. It's so this type of enema is really very beneficial in in such conditions and long term use. Plus, this type of enema can also be you know used in. Uh, It should be given in children, in old people, and those who are emaciated, weak. So even in conditions where not other types of enema are not advised, we can give matra vasti. But the only thing is matra vasti is always an oil.
we cannot give matra vasti in uh, decoction form it's always given in oil form this is the speciality of matra vasti and then we have another sesame oil yes can be given Uh, and we, we usually uh, medicate the oil. So the oil is medicated most of the time and we give. Now the another interesting type of vasti is uttara vasti, which is given through the genital organs. Have any one of you tried this? This is very helpful in many specific diseases of the genital organs, both the male and the female. In the diseases of genitalia of women, the vasti is administered to the urethra as well as the uterus. So both into the urinary bladder as well as the uterus and this type of vasti is called uttara vasti and about 30 ml is administered in much smaller doses is this practiced by you you have any experience Okay, so in males, it's also administered to the urethra. And you can know this is very specialized. This is given only in very specific, you know, situations and conditions. It's not normally, you know, used widely. So this is Uttara Vasti. This is another type of Vasti. Now, as we discussed, and this is the... Uh, last points that I want to discuss today is about combination vastis. So that's the main principle of learning that we take. That vastis are always given in combination. And there are some combination packages or which we call as vasti programs in which we combine oil enema and decoction enema and we create vasti programs. And three such vasti programs are explained in the Ayurvedic texts, and these are the Karma Vasti, Kala Vasti, and the Yoga Vasti. The three types of Vastis. So, in this package called Karma Vasti, now we are back to the normal Vasti given through these are rectal enemas. We are not anymore talking about Uttara Vasti, these are all rectal enemas. And here, 30 vastis are administered in total. And this is the sequence. In this vasti procedure called karma vasti, one oil enema is administered first. Then 12 decoction enemas and oil enemas are administered alternatively. So there's one oil enema, then 24 enemas, which means 12 decoction enemas and 12 oil enemas. And in the end, again, five oil enemas are given. So we start with one oil enema, then there are 24 decoction and oil enemas alternated, and then in the end, five oil enemas are given. So this is... 30 vastis administered together and this protocol is called as karma vasti. This is one way to do it. Now this is a very high-end program and this can be administered and given only to people who are very strong and who need very intense treatment. Uh, now we have a more simpler program.
and this is called as Kalavasti. And in Kala Vasti, there are 15 Vastis, and first one oil enema is given, then five decoction and five oil enemas. So that makes it 10 plus 1, 11, and then finally, three to four oil enemas are administered, and that makes us 15. 15. Uh, you know, enemas, which this is called as Kala Vasti. This is another program. And then we have Yoga Vasti, in which eight Vastis are administered. So at first, one oil enema is given, and then three decoction and oil enemas, and then in the end, one oil enema. So this Yoga Vasti is a very simple protocol. So if you are giving coffee enema or some such very strong decoction enema, you can develop it into a yoga vasti program and then balance it with oil and decoction. And then you will get a more balanced and more profound effect. The effects will be multiplied much better. And so this is the programs for vasti. So in this way, today we have discussed the major procedures of Panchakarma. So we learned many principles of panch Panchakarma here, and we understood that these three major procedures directly act on the three doshas, and that is why they become so important in Panchakarma. So this actually means self-urine therapy and Ayurveda is not generally not recommending, it's not been advised, not advised in Ayurveda, but you know, you can use it with your discretion, you can use it, but urine is also very strong, so the principle is that if you are using such strong uh, substances, then you must balance it with oil and other other suitable herbs. So that's a key, key principle according to Ayurveda. So this is just the difference is, you know, uh, just like herbal medicine and Ayurveda. Herbal medicine, you use single herbs, we use single things. In Ayurveda, it's always balance. We never use anything alone. So finding the balance between the three doshas. Yes, can be done. It can be done. So that you can do in a very careful manner. But the principle here of Vasti is very universal. So if you follow this principle of Vasti, then we can be sure that we will not produce unwanted effects. The three doshas will remain balanced. The ultimate goal is that the at the end of our procedures, the three doshas should remain balanced.
So with that, we conclude today's webinar. Yeah.